Good afternoon. I am here at the JLF, the Jaipur Literature Festival, with Christina Lam, uh, the amazing journalist uh, who uh, who had covered war, strife, and she had uh, written the biography of rather he had co-authored with Malala. I am Malala, and now she's back again with yet another not so very well known story, but an important story from Syria. Uh, the book is The Girl from Aleppo. It's about Nujin, Nujin Mustafa, and her war to freedom. You call it. Christina, tell me, how did you discover uh, Nujin? So I was covering the refugee crisis in 2015 when more than a million refugees came into Europe, and I could stop. Yeah. So you were talking about uh, covering yeah. the. So I was covering the refugee crisis in 2015 when more than a million refugees came into Europe from mostly war-torn places like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. And I was concerned as a journalist that a lot of the way that they were being referred to by political leaders and others was as this kind of mass, not in a human way but talking of them as an epidemic or a plague or even words like parasites when actually when you met refugees they all were people like us who had you know stories nobody chooses to leave their home they'd all been through terrible things and were making these really difficult journeys so I wanted to find a way of kind of humanizing the refugee crisis if you like and finding one person to tell the story through so, so yeah that, that that i think and how did how did i mean there are so many refugees how did you kind of spot her Jean? well the first thing was i mean i was actually fascinated at the whole mechanics of being a refugee how do you do it how do you know where to go you know when they crossing borders um how you know how do you know which particular sunflower field in croatia to cross or um and also how do you get money where do you sleep where do you go to the toilet um things that i just thought were really um, not reported much and so i was trying to find someone in a way to tell the story through and it seemed to me that it's a really difficult journey to, it's hard to be a refugee and it's a really difficult journey for an able-bodied person and then I met this 16 year old girl in a wheelchair being pushed by her sister and I thought you know my god how can you do that journey in a wheelchair it's so difficult um, and I met Najin at the Hungarian border so the, the refugee crisis basically you saw like the best and worst of humanity and the best were local people who came out and helped and brought clothes and food for people the worst was governments that erected new borders within Europe probably the worst of all was Hungary very hard line government of Viktor Orban and they erected a 12 foot high fence between Hungary and Serbia to stop people coming in. So I was there the day in September 2015 when they finished that fence. And um, I heard that the other side of the fence, there was a group of refugees and among them was a girl in a wheelchair who spoke fluent English and wanted to be an astronaut. And that seemed like kind of journalistic gold. So I wanted to find out. Um, when I found her, Najin was all of those things. And the most astonishing thing to me was she spoke completely fluent English, and yet she had never been to school because she, there was no way of getting her really out of their fifth floor apartment in Aleppo. We had no lift or anything. Um, so all she'd done was watch television day and night, and she learned English from watching an American soap opera called Days of Our Lives. And spoke fluent English. Um, so, and she was very funny. And so I just um, immediately was fascinated by her story. 
And actually, she, because she likes to Google everything, she kind of collects information, knows all sorts of interesting facts. She Googled me and saw that I had written the book with Malala. So then she kept saying to me, you get to write a book with me. <laughs> um, and then I thought, actually, yeah, because I don't want to write. It would be very easy to write a miserable refugee book about how difficult. And, but Nujin's not like that. She it is difficult, but she is very inspiring and upbeat about the whole thing so she's one of those people that if you spend an hour with you feel better about life <laughs> yeah definitely it looks like a story of hope and a story of strength uh, so while writing the story and i mean while while listening to her uh, i'm sure there may be uh, there may be so many revealing moments in terms of her story in terms of the crisis itself and the refugees so maybe could you share a couple of uh, if you if you could remember any of them well of course you know the journey was very difficult and i mean one of the hardest parts is when they have to cross the sea from turkey to greek islands and so people were having to pay a lot of money to people smugglers who were then cramming far too many people in these old dinghies. So a dinghy that was meant for 15 or 10 people, they would put 30, 40, 50 people. So um, although it wasn't that far a distance, it was actually really dangerous because of the way they were going. And so when Najin crossed, it was actually the same day that the little boy, Aylan Kurdi, washed up. In, in Turkey on that same stretch which shows just how dangerous it is and she was in this dinghy and um, people didn't like the wheelchair being in it because they thought you know it's a rubber dinghy it could puncture so the people started saying we should take the wheelchair out um, and, but anyway in the end they let us stay <laughs> It must have been a terrifying moment for her. The wheelchair was her legs. Yeah, but there were also like funny moments. So, for example, I asked her, what do you think of Europe? And she said, well, I'm disappointed. So I was a bit surprised. Like, why are you disappointed? And she said, because I used to watch MasterChef on TV and I thought the food would look like that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's interesting. So, um... When, when, when Nujin was talking to you, and uh, I mean, uh, this was there was a time you would do war histories, but now you're doing biographies. Nujin and I am Malala. What, what? How do you see both of them? I mean, well, it's the same. I've always just told people's stories in all my books, whatever mm-hmm. it's about, whether it's about war or um, other things. And I mean, you know, Nujin's story is a story of war because the reason she was fleeing Syria was because of the war. They were bombed in Aleppo. They were went to another town called Membeach and then ISIS came in and started um, beheading people. And so that's why they, they fled. So the two things are completely related. In fact, I thought at the beginning of the refugee crisis, well, good. <laughs> now Western governments will have to do something about these endless wars but in fact they didn't so where is Nujin now she's in Germany Uh and um, she's happy to be safe she's living with her sister Uh, she went to school for the first time in her life Um, and that was I mean she was happy to go to school but it was difficult as well because she by then was 18 um, and had never done basic things like addition, although she's phenomenally bright and used to watch National Geographic and the History Channel, so knows huge amounts of history and about space and physics. But So she felt in some lessons really stupid because she just didn't know. And yet in other things, of course, she was so much ahead of other people. So it's not been so easy and of course hard because her parents are still in Turkey her uh, brother and sister is still in Syria so she worries a lot about them but she um, no, she's kind of flourishing in Germany and she makes me love for example once I went there and she got a brace on her teeth and she was really happy about that she's like look you know I've got a brace you, like might have started, you, you kind of start feeling a little bit a little connection 
because you've been speaking to her amazing and i think the book promises to make that connect with the readers uh, and and also uh, may i also ask you like in india we have this discourse right now about uh, citizenship about uh, calling people in and uh, and some fight against uh, i'm talk about uh, we have rohingyas from we talk about uh, sending them back so how do you see i mean it's not only in india i think everywhere there's this discussion about whether we should allow uh, refugees or whether we can allow refugees where uh, what i mean your view on it probably yeah. i mean well, I, I i only been in india to stay for a day so um, i don't think i can give a very um, informed yeah, <laughs> opinion about it's, it's but what i think Indian, uh, uh discords i think this is no, where what i think we the... are seeing though everywhere sadly is this kind of otherization of of people whether it's different religious communities or ethnic communities um you know um, um we are all humans you know the, the Syrians a, a few years earlier nobody would ever have thought that these people were going to be refugees in Europe and and you know a lot of what's interesting about Syrian refugees is an awful lot of these people are professional people they're surgeons they're lawyers they're architects you know this is just like a middle class refugees it's not um, i think people when they think of refugees often think that it's the poorest people that are coming and worry that they're coming to take their jobs and worry that they might cause crime and um actually no it's expensive to be a refugee so it's often not the poorest people and it's also difficult and you need to be resourceful so people that have managed to make the journey are actually often the kind of people that you should want in your society very very sad actually <laughs> see you bye bye thank you